Hi, I'm Neva Bryan. I lead technical product marketing here at Fivetran. Um, I am also joined by George Fraser, our CEO and co-founder, and also by Dan Lin, our VP of product for databases and destinations. One of your main focuses this year within the destination space, Dan, is obviously data lakes, which we're here to talk about. What are some of the, the challenges that are actually driving folks to adopt a, a data lake that you've seen? So how do you feel about why we've come to this point in terms of data lakes having this kind of renaissance, so to speak? That's a great question. I, mean, I remember we've been talking about data lakes in the industry since, I think, 2011. And the, the definitions changed over the years, but um, you know, it started off as dumping raw files into Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And you know, it evolved with object storage, and then people kept dumping raw files, and they added a little more structure to it over time. And the the need for structure and uh, transactions really drove a lot of the more modern table formats that have kind of like reinvented uh, the word data lake and brought in a lot more data warehousing concepts. And there's some key drivers that have really enabled it. I mean, one of the things that uh, customers are wanting to do is centralize on a much more interoperable data platform. And so with some of the renaissance that we've seen in data lakes, um, it's enabling customers to reduce copies of their data across their data estate, um, use different warehouse technologies, different query processing technologies uh, to uh, accomplish like specialized outcomes, uh, save a lot of costs in the process, and, and really kind of future-proof their architecture. So it's, a, it's an exciting moment. Right, yeah, and you mentioned um, iceberg and, and table formats. I think, George, you were in the Dublin office maybe two years ago, and you had this session with our technical team, and you talked about you know, data lakes and how we were approaching it. Can you just take us back to that decision that you made about you know, building support for Iceberg and how you approached data lakes and, and that open table format? Well, open table formats were really the key for Fivetran to be able to support data lakes in a meaningful way. Fivetran delivers data at a very high level of abstraction. The abstraction is tables. Uh, so when you replicate data with Fivetran, you don't get files. You don't get certainly not change logs. Um, you get a replica mm -hmm. of the source, whether that source is Salesforce or an Oracle database or a NetSuite instance or anything. You get a, a source in a sensible, normalized representation as a set of tables with references to each other. And our users really love that about us. Uh, it uh, internalizes a lot of complexity that we do that. But it means for data lakes, we need a way to be able to offer that high level of abstraction in a object storage environment. And for that, what we needed was open table formats. And now in Iceberg, we have them. Yeah, it's great. When you're obviously like designing the product now, Dan, um, and leading that product team in that product area, and open table formats are being discussed quite a lot at the moment. And some people are trying to choose one over the other. And then people are having massive debates on Reddit and LinkedIn. How are you approaching? our like, approach to, to open table format support and, and what we want to enable for our customers? Yeah, that's a great question. It's like in, in any of these technology transformations where there, there's a, an inflection point in the market, you, f you find some competing standards, especially in open source. Um, and there's a lot of different folks that have approached that. Eventually, you, you tend to find one or two technologies that tend to dominate. There are some you know, early indications that some of the open table formats you know, may be starting to dominate more of that market. And you know, we're, we're working with our partners and with our customers to you know, land the data in the way that, that is most accessible to them in a, a table format that, that is likely to be widely adopted by the, the, the ecosystem. And you know, Fivetran's role in that is really to, to get that data uh, accessible to our customers in the destinations of their preference. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really do play Switzerland in that sense. Sure. Um, and you mentioned, George, earlier that like open table formats really are, are the key. Are there, are there other components of how you know, you've approached building data lakes here that are also important around like the catalog and how we actually build the ingestion and how we build that engine? The existence of open table formats makes it possible mm -hmm. to deliver uh, all your data in one place in a nice relational format in a data lake environment. It doesn't make it easy. <laughs> um, and we've had to do a lot of work over the last couple of years at Fivetran, first of all, just to build a ingest service mm -hmm. that is capable of doing what we want to do with data lakes. Uh, when we get, for example, an update from a database, we don't want to go right in your data lake, hey, this table was updated. You should do something with that. <laughs> we want to go find that record and update it. Um, and we have a way of delivering uh, 
historical data that shows every version of every row that's ever existed, if that's what the customer wants, it's an option mm -hmm. uh, in Fivetran. It took a huge effort uh, from some really great engineers at Fivetran um, to, to build that ingest service that is capable of uh, delivering data to a data lake the way uh, we want to. So open table formats, uh, they, were in a, they were a key enabling mm -hmm. technology, but uh, there's still a huge amount of work in building an ingest service that's capable of delivering a high quality uh, table in an open table format in a data lake. Sure, yeah, a lot of work going on so behind the scenes. Really important, I think, evolution in data lakes, because a lot of people historically just thought of data lakes as an append-only mm -hmm. literal bucket that you just dumped your change changes into, and then you sort it out later, and you have to reconstruct what's the latest version of this record, and that puts a lot of burden downstream on the downstream query engines, and it makes it feel less like a, an analytics data warehouse that you're working with. And so while the formats enable the acid transaction something has to do that work and has to compute you know what what was the old version of this what do i have today and, and make that resolution in a way that makes it usable for the customer and interestingly that idea of oh i'm just gonna i'm gonna put the data in this very raw format in the data lake and then deal with it downstream that is an idea that has a lot of appeal to people and it is oh, totally wrong and unworkable it sold a lot of storage yeah, ten years ago. It sold a lot of dreams. <laughs> well, it just, in fact, it's it's truly unworkable. There's the sweet spot of how much processing you want to do, uh, and it's uh, it's not nothing, and it's not a full dimensional schema. <laughs> it's not master data management. Uh, it's it's something like I want to reconstruct the table as it was in the source, and that's what I want to present in the destination. Uh, and I, I think this is something that is really not obvious uh, to people who are not practitioners and haven't been in the details of it, but like this is what makes data replication hard. It's stuff like that. Yeah, yeah there's so much going on behind the scenes. Like I think in Fivetran, we always try to, to make it, you know, abstract away that complexity for our customers. How does this all come together? Then you talked about, you know, data lakes historically being basically just a dumping ground for files. How are you seeing like modern data lake architectures and how are we building towards making them not that kind of data swamp or dumping ground? Yeah, I think with, with you know, modern open table formats, um, things like Fivetran's managed data lake service where you know, we're managing that, that change tracking and updating the most recent version of records, so it's just a queryable table in your data lake. I think that's a really important step. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step, uh, I think it gets a lot of customers really excited, is now they can bring their own compute Mm -hmm. uh, and a variety of different compute options to that data. Uh, in some cases, cross-cloud, uh, multi-cloud options, some cases, single cloud, um, that allows you to choose the right compute for the task. If you're doing a lot of transformation, uh, you don't always have to use the same compute for data preparation and transformation activities as for uh, deep analytical use cases where you mm -hmm. need to be crunching much more deeply. And so put it, putting that together to give users the flexibility in that unlocks a lot of benefits for them, especially in terms of cost savings, in terms of interoperability. You know, you do an acquisition, you, you might want to bring in a whole different data warehouse that you wasn't part of your stack before and allows you to get up and running with that, that new stack much more quickly. Totally, yeah. And we talked about open table formats being kind of the enabler. Another piece of the, another component of it is kind of like the catalogs and how they enable, you know, that interoperability and multiple query engines to, to query that, that data lake. How have we like thought about catalogs in Fivetran and how do we think about integrating with them to make that whole thing as seamless as possible? Yeah, it's interesting. Like the renaissance of data data lakes is really kind of decomposing the idea of the data warehouse, mm -hmm. where you know the data warehouse has your storage, it has your table structure, it has your compute, your query engine, and then it has your catalog of all those tables. And um, I think that word catalog gets, gets kind of overloaded sometimes where we're talking about r super bit rich metadata catalogs for full uh, business governance. And then you're talking about a, a technical catalog of where's my tables, where's my views, where's the permissions for all that. Mm -hmm. The catalog situation is, is really a mess <laughs> right now. I, I think with catalogs, the existence of choice is not helpful. Uh, none of them is really better than any other. Uh, it would be better if there were just one, if we could somehow get every all the promulgators of the various catalogs to get together and, I don't know, uh, roll a big dice and one of them can win <laughs> and then we can all just use that. I, I think it is winnowing in some ways. I, I think the Iceberg API-based catalog is the 
the best contender right now because like all things with iceberg it's minimalist uh and that makes it easier for multiple vendors to adopt it uh so i'm hopeful that the ecosystem will uh uh, will centralize around that solution. And uh, we do host a uh, implementation of the REST API catalog with every five chain data lake you get in the box, an implementation of that. But we will also connect to other catalogs and write data to them. Um, we, we will go wherever we need to go in order to make this work. That's kind of what five chain does is we glue things together and make it work. We're the incidental complexity business. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work no matter what happens. But hopefully hopefully we'll continue to see winnowing in this space. You know, we had three table formats. I think now we're down to sort of like one and a half. Uh, and uh, we have like maybe six catalogs right now. And so hopefully that will shrink over time. We need catalogs to have like a USB-C moment where everyone's just like, we're on this standard. And yeah, maybe we can. Have, maybe the European Union can, yeah. can mandate it. Let's work on that. I mean, they made Apple put yeah. that new plug on the iPhone. Can the EU regulators come in and just be like, you all have to use this catalog? It would make a, our lives a bit easier. Um, in terms of obviously, we talked at the at the start about some of the the challenges, and that's kind of what's it's driving some of this data lake adoption. Um, what are some of the the benefits? Like we're obviously with the movement at the moment. You mentioned like the you know breaking up different parts of the data stack. And maybe this is finally us delivering on the separation of storage and compute. Like, what are some of the, the benefits of like adopting this data lake architecture and why are, why are customers doing it? Well, in some ways, it's a small change. We're moving from implicit separation of storage and compute to explicit separation of storage and, and compute. Um, the benefits to customers, uh, it, it depends. Um, for the largest customers, there can be a significant cost benefit um, because uh, mostly because uh, you can avoid multiple copies of the data. The largest customers will typically have multiple analytical compute engines, and they, um, if they don't have a data lake, that means they have to store multiple copies of the same data in order to make it accessible in multiple engines. Um, so, so for them, there can be significant cost savings. And then for smaller customers, uh, it's largely about future proofing. Um, I think for smaller customers, the benefit of data lakes really depends on vendors like Fivetran making them as easy to adopt as um, tightly integrated uh, storage and compute engines that are designed to work together. You can do it basically just by pushing one button. And then the benefit to you is that you're future proof. Um, you didn't really have to do anything extra to get that. Uh, the other benefit is if, if you're on Fivetran, um, you save ingest costs. So ingest costs are, are huge. Um, they're sort of the um, uh, people, the unnoticed uh, <laughs> part of data warehouses. So the, the cost of just ingesting the data into the data warehouse represents about um, 20 or 30 percent of the total cost of the data warehouse compute mm -hmm. uh, in, in a typical customer implementation. Some are higher, some are lower, but that is a, a typical number. Five trans number in our own data warehouse is about that. Um, and if you look at uh, samples of customer queries that have been published by Snowflake and Redshift, that is the number mm -hmm. that you see. Um, so in a data lake environment, if it's a five trans data lake, we actually internalize the ingest costs so that that um, data lake ingest service that we've worked so hard to develop that we're so proud of because it's designed to work with five chain data pipelines it's incredibly efficient uh, and so we are able to just internalize the cost of ingest into the same price you pay uh, to replicate data with five chain into directly into a, a traditional data warehouse um, and so even as a very small company you will see a significant savings there yeah we're starting to see that with some of the customers i know you're meeting with as well that's kind of like ingest cost reductions, which has obviously been pretty impactful. But also on the other piece that George mentioned about, you know, future proofing your architecture, obviously there's there's benefits to being able to adopt, you know, any specialized engine as it comes out or any other vendor as they come out with new features, right? It's very competitive at the moment. People are releasing X and their competitors are re releasing Y constantly. And so having the flexibility to be able to kind of choose between those if you have that 
that kind of standardized table format is obviously beneficial. Yeah, it's like I've, I've seen over the years folks choose, you know, warehouse X or warehouse Y mm -hmm. because of that one killer feature they have. Totally. Yeah. And then you, you drag a whole bunch of your procurement decisions by that one feature and you create a bunch of copies of the data mm. um, simply because you really want to access to that super killer feature. You know, with, with data lakes especially, it's it's you don't have to drag that entire procurement decision to get that one new feature from that, that you know, new warehouse or new new query technology. Uh, because you have that decoupled storage layer that gives you a table interface, that's an ACID compliant table interface, uh, you can bring different you know, warehouse engines, different qu query engines to try out those, those you know, bleeding edge new features. Um, you know, George, as George said, it's feature proofing. If you, something new comes out, you don't have to go create a whole new set of copies, you know, redo all your replications somewhere. Right? And so it really is a, a key enabler for customers. BDM. Um, OK, well, we might just uh, finish off with some more kind of where, where do we see the, the future of this data lake architecture going? So we might start with you, George, if you want to make any other other predictions than you made uh, early, earlier in the session about uh, us standardizing maybe on, on one catalog. But anything else that you think will change over the next 12 to 18 months of data lakes? Or do you just think more adoption of kind of that emerging technology? I think as the vendors continue to collaborate, including us, on simplifying and reducing the number of labors, um, you will see data lakes get easier and easier to adopt. And eventually, they will just become an invisible part of the stack. People will adopt data lakes without even knowing it. This, in my mind, is the milestone for Fivetran. Um, when will we change our own defaults so that when you set up a standard, a, a traditional destination like Databricks or Snowflake or BigQuery or Redshift, the default uh, mode even if you're only interested in sending data to that one destination, is to create a data lake, create all the tables in there, stick a catalog on it, register the catalog and the destination. As a user, you end up with the exact same uh, experience. Mm -hmm. You just pay no ingest costs. And if you ever want to change destinations or add an additional destination, it's a, it's a no movement operation. You're just pointing a, another compute system at the same uh, at the same tables. I think that's going to really be the watershed. I think that's, that's really exciting because it's going to allow folks to take their their data warehousing budgets and put them to much better use. Like, right, if you're, you know, it's 20, 20, 30 percent you're spending on, on ingest and transformation costs. That's, that's a lot of like really premium compute dollars that you're pointing at uh, like really, you know, mundane table stakes type compute. Um, and so, if you can start start to specialize on that, and then and take those budgets and use them for you know higher value you know business outcomes, that's really exciting. I think uh, really excited to see what customers do with that and you know freedom. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to end. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>